Welcome to this video where we're going to be looking at the pathophysiology of rhabdomyolysis. Rhabdomyolysis refers to the sudden and excessive breakdown of skeletal muscle, which causes the intracellular components of the muscle cell to enter general circulation. And for the extracellular components to enter the muscle cell. Rhabdomyolysis can range from an asymptomatic illness to a life threatening condition. Before we look at the pathophysiology of rhabdomyolysis, we're going to go over some basic anatomy and physiology that will help in our understanding of the condition. Feel free to skip this part though, timestamps are in the description below. Skeletal muscle within the human body is encased in a protective framework called a fascia. And the fascia consists of three layers. The outermost layer is the epimyceum, epi meaning on and mice to mean muscle. It is a layer of dense irregular connective tissue which ensheaths the entire muscle and tapers at the end to form a tendon that allows for movement of a joint. The next layer is the perimyceum, peri meaning around. This is a sheath of connective tissue that groups muscle fibres into bundles, or what are known as fascicles. The endomyceum, endo meaning within, is a layer of areolar connective tissue that encompasses each individual muscle fibre. It also contains capillaries, nerves and lymphatics. It overlies the muscle fibre's cell membrane, which is called the sarcolemma. The sarcolemma, sarc meaning flesh and lemma meaning sheath, encases each muscle fibre. And each muscle fibre is a single muscle cell, which is cylindrical in shape. The muscle cell contains myofibrils within the sarcolemma. And myofibrils are the contractile fibres of the cell. The myofibrils are made up of thick and thin myofilaments. The thick filaments are composed of myosin, and the thin filaments are predominantly actin, along with two other muscle proteins, tropomyosin and troponin. Muscle contraction is caused by the interaction between actin and myosin as they temporarily bind to each other. Due to the high energy demands of skeletal muscle, there are high concentrations of mitochondria which are responsible for creating adenosine triphosphate and adenosine triphosphate is what the cell uses for energy and this is achieved by a complex cycle involving glucose and oxygen. Myoglobin is a red coloured protein that binds oxygen molecules that diffuse into the cell. Myoglobin then releases them again when the mitochondria require oxygen for adenosine triphosphate production. Located on the sarcolemma or the muscle cell wall are ion channels, including sodium potassium pumps and sodium calcium exchangers. These ion channels are responsible for maintaining the concentration gradient between extracellular and intracellular ions. In particular, these ion channels maintain low intracellular levels of sodium and calcium and high concentrations of intracellular potassium. Muscle depolarization results in an influx of calcium, causing the muscle cells to contract through actin and myosin interaction. All of these processes are dependent on the availability of sufficient energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate, and these pumps don't work unless that energy source is present. The kidneys are responsible for several homeostatic processes. 
Some of these include the regulation of blood electrolytes, such as sodium and potassium, the regulation of blood pH by excreting hydrogen ions in urine and absorbing bicarbonate, the regulation of blood volume by conserving or eliminating water, regulation of blood pressure through the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the production of hormones such as vitamin D that promotes calcium absorption, and erythropoietin that promotes erythrocyte production. And finally, the kidneys are responsible for the elimination of waste products such as creatinine, urea, ammonia, and metabolized drugs. The nephron is the functional aspect of the kidney that's responsible for filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. There are approximately one to one and a half million nephrons in each kidney. The nephron consists of several key structures, which include the glomerulus, the Bowman's capsule or glomerular capsule, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, which consists of the descending and ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. The glomerulus is a network of capillaries where blood enters via an afferent arteriole and then exits via an efferent arteriole. The Bowman's capsule or glomerulus capsule is the filtering unit. So now we have an understanding of normal muscle structure and the function of the kidney, Let's look at the pathophysiology of rhabdomyolysis. As we have already mentioned, rhabdomyolysis is a clinical syndrome where there is a sudden and excessive breakdown of skeletal muscle. This causes the release of the intracellular components such as myoglobin, creatine kinase and lactate dehydrogenase as well as electrolytes, to enter the extracellular space. This is in combination with the extracellular components moving into the muscle cell, such as sodium, calcium and water. Rhabdomyolysis ranges from an asymptomatic illness with mild elevation in creatine kinase levels, to a life-threatening condition associated with electrolyte imbalances and acute kidney injury. Excessive muscle breakdown is caused by either direct myocyte injury or failure of the energy supply within the muscle cell, or both can occur simultaneously. Both direct myocyte injury and depleted ATP levels have multiple causes, which we will go on to discuss later. Direct myocyte injury will damage the sarcolemma, which, as we mentioned, is the muscle cell wall. And in normal physiology, this provides a physical barrier between the intracellular components of the muscle cell and the extracellular contents. A disruption to the physiological barrier will cause a disruption to the proper balance of intracellular and extracellular electrolyte and fluid concentrations, as there will be no barrier stopping these ions from moving down their concentration gradients. When we discussed ion channels and adenosine triphosphate production in the anatomy and physiology, we mentioned how important their function was in maintaining ionic balance. Therefore, any insult that damages the ion channels through direct myocyte injury or that reduces the availability of adenosine triphosphate will cause a disruption in the proper balance of intracellular electrolyte concentration as the pumps will no longer function. Myocyte injury or adenosine triphosphate depletion results in an excessive influx of sodium and calcium into the muscle cell. This is due to the concentration difference between the extracellular 
and intracellular sodium and calcium levels, which can no longer be maintained either because there's damage to the cell wall or the pumps which maintain the ionic balance are no longer functioning. Extracellular concentrations of sodium are approximately 12 times higher than intracellular levels, and extracellular concentrations of calcium are approximately 10,000 times greater than intracellular concentrations. So these ions will naturally move down their concentration gradients, causing an influx of sodium and calcium into the cell. An increase in intracellular sodium draws water into the cell, causing edema, and further disrupts the integrity of the cell wall. This causes a loss of extracellular fluid, and may even lead to shock due to the loss of circulating fluid volume. The loss of sodium and calcium from the extracellular space into the intracellular space of the myocyte can also cause hyponatremia, which is low sodium, and hypocalcemia, which is low calcium. The prolonged presence of high calcium levels leads to a sustained contraction of the muscle cell and further depletes the adenosine triphosphate levels. This elevation in calcium activates calcium-dependent proteases, and a protease is an enzyme that breaks down protein, which damages the cytoskeleton of the cell, promoting rupture of the cellular membrane and further damage to the ion channels. 98% of total body potassium is located within cells, with 2% of total body potassium being located in the extracellular space. Just like sodium and calcium, when the muscle cell wall is damaged or when the ion channels can no longer function, potassium will move down its concentration gradient, leading to an increase in extracellular potassium known as hyperkalemia, which can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. A serious complication of rhabdomyolysis is the development of an acute kidney injury, and an acute kidney injury is a clinical syndrome where there is a sudden decline in kidney function, with a decrease in glomerular filtration and urine output. This is caused by multiple mechanisms in rhabdomyolysis, including obstruction of the kidney tubules, direct injury to the cells of the kidney tubules, and renal vasoconstriction that reduces kidney perfusion and the amount of urine that's produced. We spoke earlier about myoglobin, which is a component of Myocytes. When myoglobin enters the extracellular space, it will eventually be filtered by the kidney. Myoglobin reacts with a protein that's found in the kidney called TAM horseful protein, which is excreted by the tubular cells from within the nephron. When myoglobin interacts with the TAM horseful protein, they form intratubular casts. And an intratubular cast is where proteins solidify in the lumen of the nephron. The low pH of urine promotes this pathological process by formation of stronger and more rapid bonds between the protein and myoglobin. These casts cause direct tubular cell injury, as well as tubular obstruction. Renal vasoconstriction is caused by reduced renal blood flow due to the loss of extracellular fluid, which, as we mentioned, has entered into the damaged muscle cells. This is further enhanced by secondary activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which is activated by low circulating fluid, low sodium and high potassium levels all of which are clinical manifestations of rhabdomyolysis. It's important to remember that an acute kidney injury will further worsen any electrolyte abnormalities and hypotension that has occurred due to the rhabdomyolysis. To recap, rhabdomyolysis is a clinical syndrome where there is a sudden and excessive breakdown of muscle, 
that causes the release of the intracellular components into general circulation, as well as extracellular components moving into the intracellular space of the muscle cell. Excessive muscle breakdown is caused by either direct myocyte injury or a failure of the energy supply within the cells, or both can occur simultaneously. Myocyte injury or adenosine triphosphate depletion results in excessive intracellular sodium and calcium levels, which cause sustained myofibril contraction, damage to the cytoskeleton, and rupture of the cell membrane due to edema. Causes can either be traumatic or non traumatic, and symptoms can range from an asymptomatic illness to a life threatening condition. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video helpful. Be sure to check out our other videos, and if there are any topics you would like us to cover, then please leave a comment in the comment section below.